Welcome to our second video lecture covering the material that is in uh, chapter 4. In, in this video, we're going to continue our discussion of discrete probability distributions. In the last video, we talked about empirical discrete probability distributions, where we relied on tables uh, and graphs and a frequency distribution to define f of x, or our probability function. It was necessary that we tabulate every possible value that x could take on and then enumerate its relative frequency. That's not always necessary. Oftentimes, we can use formulas to describe the probability function for a discrete random variable rather than having to tabulate all the possible values and calculate the relative frequencies. There are several important discrete probability distributions that have this property. They include the discrete uniform distribution, and in the next chapter, we're going to talk about the continuous uniform distribution, so I won't talk too much more about that here. We have the binomial distribution, which I believe is probably the most important discrete probability distribution that's covered in your textbook. The other two distributions that are covered in your textbook are the Poisson and the hypergeometric. And while they're important, and they have important applications in statistics and econometrics, because of time, I'm not going to cover them here. If you can understand the binomial probability distribution, then moving on to the Poisson or the hypergeometric distribution should pose little problem for you should the need arise that you, that, you, uh, that you want to use them. For a binomial probability distribution, we're going to talk about a binomial experiment. So we're going to go back to the experiment and we're going to talk about a random variable that is defined over the sample space and then we're going to derive a formula that describes the probability function for that random variable. The four properties of a binomial experiment are as follows. First, the experiment consists of a sequence of n identical trials. So we're going to have this, this experiment. It's often called a Bernoulli trial. I'll explain that in, a, in just a minute here. But we're going to have this experiment, and we're going to run it any number of times that we desire. We can run the experiment once, which isn't so interesting. We can run it twice, 10 times, 100 times, however many times we want to run this, this Bernoulli trial, we're going to run this Bernoulli trial. And the second property is that the outcome of each one of these experiments, these Bernoulli trials, can lead to only one of two outcomes. You can either end up with a success or a failure. And by success and failure, really, I mean a success or a failure from a statistical point of view. So this sometimes can create confusion. For example, if I have a binomial variable, um, which is male or female, so I'm randomly selecting individuals, right? And I'm looking to see whether or not they're a male or a female. And uh, I could say that a success is finding a female, or I could say a success is finding a male. Either interpretation is okay, and it doesn't imply you know, anything bad about picking a female if a success is considered a male, or anything bad about males if a success is is picking a female, it's just a success from, this, from a statistical point of view. Now, this is true in business, too. There are cases where you might want to define a binomial distribution for the number of defective parts. In that case, you know, finding a defect is a statistical success. It doesn't mean it's a business success, though, to produce parts that are defective. So you just have to keep that in mind um, when, you in, when you're interpreting the random variable. Also, uh, property three of a binomial experiment is that the probability of success, which we'll denote by P, doesn't change from one of these trials to the next trial. It's constant across trials. Of course, one minus P will be the probability then of a failure. And the trials are independent of each other. That will allow for a very simple application of the multiplication rule in deriving the binomial uh, probability function. So our interest here is in the number of successes occurring in n trials, where we numerically code a success as 1 and a failure as 0. We let n x uh, denote the number of successes that occur within n trials. Now, before we move on to this Evans electronics example, let's just think very briefly about flipping a coin. Clearly, our coin flipping exercise, where we flip a coin two times, is an example of a binomial, uh, uh, a binomial experiment. 
each time we flip the coin, it's a Bernoulli trial. Uh, when I flip a coin the first time and the second time, those two flips are independent of each other. The probability of a success, let's say just define a success as flipping a heads instead of a tails, the probability of flipping a heads is constant and equal to 0.5 within each one of the trials, and each trial only has two possible outcomes, either a success, flipping a heads, or a failure. So clearly all the probabilities that we've calculated in terms of that two-step experiment where we flip a coin once and then we flip a coin again, right? And we look at the number of heads and we count them up and we call that a random variable. Right? You can calculate all of those probabilities using the formulas that we're going to cover for the binomial probability distribution. You should do that to verify that you understand how to use the binomial probability distribution. Here we're going to look at an example we have Evans Electronics. Evans Electronics is concerned about their turnover and their employees. In recent years, they've noticed that about 10% of the uh, hourly employees leave annually. Thus, for any hourly employee chosen at random, right, they estimate that the probability of leaving is equal to 0.1. We're going to consider that to be equal to P. P is going to be equal to 0.1. And we're going to select employees, and every time we select an employee, we're going to use uh, uh, leaving um, as being sort of a statistical success and staying as being a statistical failure. So 1 minus P, 1 minus 0.1 is 0.9. So an individual has a 90% chance of being here in a year if we select them, and a 10% chance of leaving. Every time we select an, uh, a, uh, an hourly employee and observe whether or not they leave, we're running one trial in a binomial experiment. So suppose that we want to talk about the probability that when we select three employees at random, one of them leaves. Well, that's a fairly easy calculation based on what we know. What we have is we want uh, really one success out of three. And there are three different ways to find one success out of three. Either we could have a success and two failures, or a failure, then a success in the middle, and a failure. Or a failure, a failure, and a success. Okay. In each one of these cases, we essentially get uh, the same answer. A success is, is equal to P, which is 0.1, times 1 minus P, right? That's the probability of a failure, multiplied again by the probability of a failure. Notice that this is the application of our multiplication rule. We're asking for the probability that we get a success and a failure and a failure. And when you hear and, right, you should think about the intersection and you should think about the multiplication rule. Here, though, we don't have to worry about conditional probabilities. Why? Because each one of these trials is considered independent. So we have independent events. So we can simply calculate the probability of a success, a failure, and a failure as P times 1 minus P times 1 minus P which is 0.1 times 0 0.9, 0 0.9, which is 0 0.081. There are actually three different ways to motivate one success out of three of these random trials. So we have to do this three times. In this case, we have the probability of a failure and a success and a failure. And here we have the probability of a failure and a failure and a success. But in either case, every time we make this calculation, we come up with 0 0.081. And when we add them all up, we get the probability that our random variable, the number of successes in three trials, takes on a value of 1. So again, remember that in this case, lowercase n is equal to 3. We have run this trial, um, this, this experiment. You know, This experiment in includes basically running the trial three times. Let me put it that way. So lowercase n is equal to 3. And we're here looking here for the probability, right? The probability that x takes on a value of 1. So what is the probability that x takes on a value of 1? That's what we've calculated. And we've calculated that that probability is equal to 0 0.243. Okay? All right. So with this, we can motivate a more general formula for the probability function.
for, uh, for a, a binomial probability distribution or a random variable that's binomially distributed. Basically, what you'll notice is that uh, we have to take P and we need to raise P to the number of successes that we're looking for. In this case, that happens to be equal to 1, right? Because we're looking for x equals 1 success, so P will show up once. If we had been looking for the probability of two successes out of three, then we would have, for example, in this formula, P multiplied by P multiplied by 1 minus P, and we'd have to take the P and we'd have to raise it to the 2 power. So in general, in this formula, we're going to take P and we're going to raise it to the number of successes. And then we're going to take 1 minus P, which is the probability of a failure. And in this example, because we're looking for one success, and n minus 1 is 2, we must be looking for two failures. So that's 1 minus p squared Okay, in this example. But in general, we're going to take the number of trials, n, minus the number of successes. That's the number of failures that are left over. So we're going to have to raise 1 minus p to the n minus x power. And then, of course, finally, we need to account for the fact that here we had to add up three different probabilities. Well, where does that come from? Well, that comes from uh, the formula for, um, from combinatorics that we talked about for combinations. What we're really looking at here is the number of ways that we can select one success, right, out of, out of the three different trials. So that's sort of combi the combination formula. How do I choose one out of three? Okay. Or in general, if we want to generalize the formula, this will be um, equal to n here, and we'll have x in the combinatoric formula. I know this is messy, but we'll see the formula formally on the next page. But I want you to understand that uh, the formula for the probability function for a binomial experiment is very easily understood. It may look complicated when you first see it, but if you just step back and you go all the way back to the experiment and the possible experimental outcomes in the sample space, and attach probabilities and then think about how we're defining the random variable, it's quite easy to understand how we can come up with a formula for the probability function for, uh, for a, a random variable that follows a binomial probability distribution. And there are a lot of other probability distributions which can be understood just as simply. So here's the, you know, here's the formula um, in all of its glory. Right? Uh, we've got the formula for combinations out here in front. Again, you should understand every single aspect of this formula by now. This is the number of trials, the number of successes, the probability of a success is equal to p. You plug the numbers in, you, know, you can vary x. Uh, x, you know, can be any value from 0 all the way up to n. Obviously, x can't be greater than n. And, uh, and you can calculate the probability of that number of successes in n trials. So, you know, let's go ahead and use this in order to recalculate the probability that we just calculated for Evans Electronics. N in that case is equal to 3. We had three employees that we picked at random. We wanted the probability that one of them would leave. So we want one success, right? So this gives me the combinations of 1 uh, and 3, right? Um, so, you know, 3 choose 1, if you will the number of ways I can find one slot within the three to define as a success. Uh, and I've got my point one, which is my probability of a success, raised to the number of successes times the, the probability of a failure, one minus p, raised to the number of failures if I have one success. And since I have three trials, one success would leave only two possibilities for failure. Okay, and I put all of that into a calculator or into Excel and it will find that the answer is 0.243 or 24.3%, you know, which is exactly what we calculated on the previous slide. Okay. Uh, statisticians have developed tables, really, that give the, these probabilities for you and also provide cumulative probabilities for binomial random variables. And I think that you should, I, I think that you should be able to use the formula. I think you should be able to read the tables and it's very important that you be able to use the Excel function, uh, the different Excel functions um, for all of the chapters that we're covering in this course. And of course, you know that at the end of the chapter notes, there are detailed instructions on how to use Excel. And you should definitely know how to do uh, all of this work.
in Excel. And very soon I'll be sort of bringing some more Excel um, into these videos by going back and forth between the presentations and, and Excel when it becomes too cumbersome to use to use tables or do calculations by hand we'll start to use Excel a little bit more even in these videos particularly when we do statistical uh, inference but here we're going to use a table you find these commonly in the back of you know statistics textbooks but again with modern calculators and software packages th these tables are almost unnecessary at this point I would have a strong preference for for using computers and software packages over looking up numbers in, in tables. But regardless, a table might look something like this uh, that you would find in a statistics textbook. Uh, what we have here is, is a table where we look up the probability of a success and th that shows up in the column and then in the outer margin of the, of the uh, rows we've got this column which signifies the number of trials, which in our case is equal to three, and of course the number of successes. So with, you know, we're looking for one success out of three trials, and the probability of a success is equal to 0.1. We find the answer is equal to 0.243, which again is the same answer now that we've come up with in three different ways. Uh, for the for the binomial probability distribution, there are these very simple formulas for the mean and the variance, and the standard deviation, of course, is just the square root of the variance. If you want to find the expected value, you can just, it's very intuitive also, you can just take the number of trials multiplied by the probability of a success from the, within each trial, and that will give you the expected value or the expected number of successes and end trials. That's so, that's so uh, simple that it almost seems trivial. Um, we can use the, the formula for variance that we covered in the last chapter to, to prove that uh, the variance of x, or what we'll call, uh, really that should be sigma squared, I apologize. It shouldn't be an S, I'll correct that right here, um, is equal to NP times Q. So the number of trials times the probability of success times the probability of a failure will give me the variance. And then, of course, I could just take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation. I'm going to ask you to apply these to, um, to a problem next. Um, so b before you get to, to answering the rest of your um, checkpoint questions, we'll apply this to the example of Evans Electronics. In that case, we had... Um, at three trials, we pick three employees and we ask what's the probability that one of them leaves. The probability of a success was equal to 0 0.1, so the expected number of employees that would leave out of three would be equal to 0.3 employees. Again, there's no need for the expected value of a discrete variable to be discrete. The variance will be equal to n times p times q, so we'll take the three trials we picked again, three employees at random. The probability of a success, so that one leaves is equal to 0.1, and the probability that they stay is equal to 0.9. So taking the product of 3.1 and 0.9, we get a variance of 0.27. And it's easier to interpret, of course, if we take the square root of, this, of the variance and get the standard deviation, so that the standard deviation is 0.52 employees. So for Evans Electronics, the expected number of employees who will leave out of 3 is equal to 0.3, with a standard deviation of 0.52 